life was given to us a billion years ago. What have we done with it? The history of Earth is unimaginably long. If it were sped up to the equivalent of a single day, all of humankind, from the earliest skeletons to the invention of the iPhone, would have occurred in only the last four seconds. Dinosaurs were still roaming Earth about 20 minutes before that. But the creation of our planet occurred more than 23 hours earlier two cycles on this clock, or 4.5 billion years ago. Before Homo sapiens began to populate the Earth, another human species had established itself across much of the Eurasian continent. Neanderthals managed to survive for some 300,000 years. They had culture, they had social systems, they had intelligence. Neanderthals had a basic language. They were talking to each other, they had speech capabilities. It was a complex and sophisticated form of language that allowed groups to exchange information with each other. The survival of the tribe was essential. That's also why groups of Neanderthals met often. For example, once a year, they gathered to exchange information and that Neanderthals also exchanged women at these meetings. They lived together in small groups and reproduced amongst themselves, and that could cause genetic problems. So, for example, I might exchange my sister for someone else's. This would help to enhance the group's genetic continuity. The he was the last of his kind, the last Neanderthal. Homo sapiens arrived in Western Europe. This development appeared to seal the fate of the Neanderthals. There's been a lot of speculation about why and how this happened. But suddenly, with the arrival of Homo sapiens, they disappeared. They never returned to the caves where they had lived. I think by 39,000 years ago, the Neanderthals had pretty largely disappeared. We've got huge amounts of data from recent humans. So if we think of humans today, Almost everyone outside of Africa has around 2% Neanderthal DNA in their genomes. The Neanderthals were quite well adapted. They'd lived in Europe and Western Asia for 200, 300,000 years before modern humans arrived. And when we arrive and we interbreed with them, what we take away and what rises in frequency and what we see today are those variants that allowed them to live and survive in that, in that habitat. Now, some of those things are advantageous today still, but some of them are also disadvantageous. They're bad for us and they might cause disease. For example, 40 or 50,000 years ago to help healing of wounds. Now that was good then in that dangerous world, but Neanderthals had developed uh, natural immunities to some of the local diseases in Europe and Asia. We didn't have those immunities having evolved in Africa. So coming out into Eurasia by interbreeding with the Neanderthals, we got a quick fix to our immune systems and we picked up some of those disease resistance factors which helped us survive. When it comes to Darwin, we did absolutely uh, misunderstand survival of the fittest. Fitness is just your ability to reproduce. So this idea that you had to be the biggest and the strongest and the meanest in order to succeed, it's not what Darwin meant at all. It's 
survival of the fittest and its misconstrual has been extremely harmful. The idea was used as a political platform to justify and to rally people, to have people feel threatened, and to have them agree to things that when you look at history, you cannot understand how people... We can see it now in how we are dealing with the pandemic. The idea that because it affects uh, people who are elderly, then maybe the natural law. The notion that one organism can eat another like a lion eats its prey in the jungle. Just like creatures in the visible world, microscopic life, like molds and bacteria, will fight each other for survival. In 1812, the year the New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery first started to publish, medical knowledge in the U.S. and in the world was limited. We had no understanding of infectious disease. Health outcomes were particularly poor for women and children. Surgery was unsanitary and performed without anesthesia. Cancer was largely unrecognized because so few people lived long enough to develop it. For millennia, there were no medicines to stop their deadly assault. But with the dawn of the 20th century, a new war against microbes was about to begin. World War I. Battles are raging across Europe. And wherever the guns go, deadly bacterial infections follow close behind bacteria. These microscopic creatures have dominated the planet for over three billion years. And they can be found everywhere. They can live in boiling water. They can live in freezing temperatures. They can live in the center of solid rock. And in fact, if we look at our own bodies, we are basically walking bacteria. There are on the order of 10 to 100 trillion bacterial cells on and in us, every one of us. We could not live without bacteria. It's 1928 and a Petri dish left next to an open window is about to revolutionize modern medicine. In a moment of epiphany, Fleming realizes the mold is defending itself by secreting something that destroys the bacteria. It's penicillin, the first antibiotic. This wonder drug and other antibiotics will go on to treat the untreatable, saving millions of lives. And the discovery of penicillin led to a great opening of the era of medicine. The realization that a simple mold could produce an effective drug inspires scientists to search for other organisms that might do the same. New medicines derived from molds, funguses, and even bacteria flood the market. Tetracycline, cephalosporin, erythromycin, called antibiotics, meaning against life. These miracle drugs can stop infections like pneumonia, gangrene, and meningitis. Two centuries later, explosion of antibiotics discovered in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The faucet is running dry. Has the clock really been ticking towards a post-antibiotic future? Because each time we used them, misused them, and overused them, we gave the bacteria a chance to become resistant. Scientists have been unable to bring new antibiotics to market. Of the hundreds of drugs currently under government review, only a handful are for bacterial infection. And that's bad news for the public. You know, in fact, I think they should be terrified. It's taken us 12 years to get tigacycline anywhere near the mark. This makes these drugs commercially unsuccessful, and it really discourages other people from going into the field. As the general population lives longer and longer, thanks to all the advances in medical science in the last century, a new report from the World Bank says that we've also created drug-resistant infections that have gone unchecked could kill some 10 million people by the year 2050. Pediatric superbugs here in Minnesota and across the country. They're often caused by misuse of antibiotics. When using too much or for too long, bacteria mutate and become antibiotic resistant. A new study looked at thousands of hospitalized kids across the country who had been prescribed antibiotics. It found more than a quarter of them either didn't need the drug or it wasn't the right one for the infection they had. COVID-19 has, you know, certainly to some extent, 
thrown gas on the fire uh, by a sort of forcing our hand to use antibiotics just because these kids are so ill. Dr. Schleiss says kids hospitalized with COVID come in with high fevers and inflammatory reactions, making it tough to immediately rule out a bacterial infection, so they may be given antibiotics unnecessarily, thus continuing a vicious cycle. The CDC calls this a public health priority, saying more global action is needed. This drug resistance is passed through sewage and septic tanks into our waterways and into the oceans. That this is even documented within Amazonian tribes who have never seen antibiotics or Western medicine before. That the balance of microbes on Earth are needed to sustain life and are indispensable to the planet's microbiome and could ultimately be the cause of our demise. Play. Influenza, Ebola, the most contagious and deadly diseases in the world could be on our doorstep overnight. Would we recognize the symptoms? Can we treat the disease or even keep it from spreading? The margin of error? Zero. At stake for the medical team, their own lives, the safety of their families, and the community where they live. 2020. Climate change is headline news. Forests burn. Scientists predict rising sea levels. There is a sense that time for action is running out. And then comes COVID. It's a fast-moving pandemic, a million dead and counting. It's 2050. The cupboard is bare. It's a biotic future, where drug-resistant infections kill 10 million people a year, where chemotherapy is unsafe where simple surgeries are too risky to perform, where the world's biggest child killer, pneumonia, is now unstoppable. Is this just a projection? And against this backdrop, a chance to change the narrative on that other looming global catastrophe. Because everyone sees now, we can mobilise. We can take individual and collective responsibility. And we must be prepared. The resistant bacteria reach the skin or intestines via food or water but the germs are also transmitted further. If someone gets ill or is injured, they can pass on serious infections. If antibiotics don't work, the bacteria quickly spread and can lead to life-threatening blood poisoning. The bacteria are a part of our ecosystem, around us, within us, trillions upon trillions, helpful as well as harmful. And resistance is natural, to be expected, until a random mutation enables the bacteria to overcome the drug. At each line, the antibiotic is 10 times more concentrated, but there are also more mutations. It's evolution by natural selection, only very, very fast. We live in a Petri dish too, but by increased misuse, we only encouraged the mutations. We overprescribed, of course we did. Medicine is not an exact science. Diagnosis is difficult, and people expect to be cured. The building is catching fire. The edifice is crumbling. The cupboard is running bare. In some ways, COVID has made the problem worse, and large quantities of antibiotics have been prescribed to patients. If it motivates us, if the world mobilizes, individuals, doctors, scientists, yes, governments and policy makers too, the solutions are scientific, but they're also economic, and they are societal. It's a collective effort. It's not a sort of an imaginary projection that it's going to get worse. We, we know that's going to happen. The point is we do have the opportunity to do something about it. 